Uh, so today we're looking into Acts chapter 2 and we're interested in the section that runs from verse 40 uh, to verse 47. With many other words he testified and he exhorted them, be saved from this perverse generation. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day they were added about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. (coughs) Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and so on. Now about 30 years ago there was a very popular, well it was very popular for a while, there was a very popular Christian book called Going to Church in the First Century. I don't know whether you ever remember that book or whether you ever read that book. Uh, and it was, it was interesting because it was, uh, I guess meant to be, uh, a description of what it would have been like to go to church in the first century. Well here we are in the 21st century Uh, and we're still going to church and uh, we will be uh, at least if not us then our brothers and sisters in Christ will be going to church or being a church or functioning as churches right up until the very end of time this tells us a little bit this passage about if you like the beginning of I suppose you could say the beginning of the Christian church (coughs) but it's not something that is going to end the Christian church it's not something that's going to peter out or be persecuted to extinction or uh, it's not something that's going to be overcome by the progress so called of the world Uh, it's going to continue until the end of time now this is the book of Acts and when you're handling the book of Acts you need to remember what you're reading you are not reading a teaching epistle you're reading a narrative you're reading a historical record you're reading the second volume of Luke's history uh, of of, uh, God's people following the death of Christ so you don't and you shouldn't go to Acts and then build doctrine on things that happen in Acts which is Sadly, what uh, has happened over the years and what still happens, a lot of Christian churches can justify their practices by pointing to various things in the book of Acts. So you do have to bear this in mind when you're reading the book of Acts. This is history. Not meant that everything you read there is necessarily going to be repeated or that you should model your experience on it. But having said that, there's some very valuable stuff here. And today, because after all it's our AGM day and it's the end of another church year, uh, if you like, so it's a good idea for us to take a few moments today and just to think about the church and uh, to have a look here and draw out some things from this little passage, uh, which I would like you to do that. And I want you to think along four lines of thought when we look into this passage from verse 40 to verse 47 this description of this first church in Jerusalem as it began Uh, and the four trains of thought or the four themes are this that these people because the church is people it's not buildings It's not institutions, it's not denominations. Uh, The church is people, souls, the people of God that make up the body of Christ. So these people are, first of all, uh, a willing, believing people. A willing, believing people. That's here in this little passage. The second thing we're told about them is that they are a separated people. They are a distinct people. The third thing is that they are a persevering people. And the fourth thing is that they are an increasing people. 
So, given that uh, we don't have time probably to go in great depth into each of those, but let's at least think along these lines for a few minutes. The first thing to note is that the people that Luke writes about here uh, that formed the church in Jerusalem were a willing, believing people. Why do I say that? Well, have a look at verse 41. This is where we... This is the first thing, this is where we begin. Uh, Now, even by saying these words, he's highlighting the contrast. There's been a whole lot of people present while while Peter has preached. Uh, And he's drawing now your attention to a distinct group of people or a section of the crowd. And this is what he says. He says, those who gladly received his word. Those who gladly received his word. By inference, not everybody did. There were an awful lot of people who didn't gladly receive his word, didn't want anything to do with his word. Having said that, this is an amazing revival, really. I mean, this is wonderful that there are so many people that gladly received his word, you know, literally um, thousands we understand really, Um, hundreds at least. So he's just by saying that, he's making a difference. And he deliberately says that they gladly received his word. Now you've got to think about this and you have to think about what lies behind this. What lies behind the fact that here is suddenly found out of the human race And what you know the Bible teaches about who we are and what we are as sinners by birth. And now there are these people who hear the gospel and on hearing the gospel they gladly receive the word. Now how do you account for that? That's the question. How do you account for a a willing believing people. We're not talking about just a believing people. He's deliberately told us they gladly received the word. These people aren't being cajoled into some some alignment with some cultish ideas. They're not being pressured. They're not being manipulated. Uh, They are from the heart willingly, gladly is his word. They are gladly responding to the gospel. Now, what accounts for this? What is your explanation of how you account for this? This is very, very important, you see. What's behind this? What made them do this? Because you need to have an answer to that that is not in conflict with the rest of the Bible and the rest of what the Bible teaches about men. And the rest of what the Bible teaches about men is that they're dead in their sin and in their trespasses. They are from the womb, they go astray, all of us. That we're children of wrath as we are. That none of us are born Christians. None of us come into this world other than being sinners, alienated from God. So how do you explain that there's now this group of people who are gladly, in the midst of people who are not gladly receiving it. There's this group of people who are gladly receiving the word. You've got to have a biblical answer for that. And the biblical answer for that, of course, forms the basis and explains really or accounts for or gives credit for everything else that happens and is described about these people in the remainder of this reading. You're going to trace it back to this, you see. You see, because it's not, it can't be a question of them suddenly deciding that they think this is a good idea in and of their own uh, in and of their own wisdom and their own volition and their own will see do you know what actually has taken place when someone becomes a Christian do you know what has to take place for someone to become a Christian for someone to be among the redeemed of God You see, um, perhaps at some point you've thought about this 
or heard about this. It's very important. Now, theologians and teachers uh, of theology um, sometimes refer to what we're talking about as the what's become known as the order salutis. Don't worry about that. In other words, they've sat down and they've tried to systematize using the Bible and work out what's actually happened that has meant someone has become a Christian. And the order salutis goes like this. This is what they conclude, and this is accurate, and this is, this is right, and I believe this is absolutely true and biblical. Okay, so this is, this is what has to happen for someone to become a Christian. First of all, election. They must be chosen by God. Sovereignly and graciously, they must be chosen, and this is what Paul's writing to the Ephesians, remember. And in the very first chapter, in the very opening words, he says um, that you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. It's mystery. It's very mysterious. And it's, it's hard to get your mind around. But this is what the Bible teaches. That before you responded to God, God was at work in your life. And that God was at work in your life and God had you in mind from eternity. You see? So, in this order salutis, election first. Then they say the next thing that has to happen is you have to hear the gospel. Because the gospel is what calls you. The gospel is what calls you to Christ. That's the way God set things up. You can't become a Christian without the gospel. People don't become Christians without hearing the gospel. As much as some people want to think that that's the case, it's not the case. You must hear the gospel. That's why there's been a tremendous missionary movement over the years. And evangelism and all this stuff because the call comes in the gospel. So you must hear the gospel. Then they say, accurately, you must be regenerated. You can't regenerate yourself. You must be regenerated. You must be born anew by God's Spirit. And that's not something that was in, is within your power to accomplish. This is something which God graciously does. And he uses his word. And then, following that, they would say, there comes justification by faith. Now you're born again and you've, you've heard the gospel, you, you're born again and you put your trust in Jesus Christ by faith. And following justification, they would say adoption, sanctification, perseverance, glorification. So, the order salutis. Think about it. Remember it. But above all, remember that it is God that makes people Christians. It's not people that make themselves Christians. It's God, God at work, God doing what only he can do in uh, causing us to be born again. So this is explaining, I'm saying this because this, this explains why these people gladly receive the word of God. And we're not going to lay uh, the credit for them doing this at their feet and say, what wonderful people they were. Not at all, because that would go against everything else that we understand about ourselves and about the Bible. So not at all. And he underlines this, just in case we haven't got the message in this little passage, he underlines it with the very last verse of the chapter. He puts it like this, in a nutshell, the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. The Lord added to the church those who were being saved. So they are willing and they are believing. But behind their willingness, behind their gladness, behind their believing is already the work of the Holy Spirit that has been going on in their life. You see? So this is wonderful. Now, if you wanted an Old Testament 
a, a wonderful reminder from the Old Testament about this. Uh, it's Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And now this is a messianic psalm. It means, you know, it's a psalm that's about Christ. And it's another one of those psalms where really you're, you're kind of listening into a conversation between the Son and the Father. Christ the Son and God the Father. It's David, humanly speaking, who's penning the psalm. But this is what the psalm's about. And so it goes like this. Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Exactly what's happening on the day of Pentecost. That's what's happening. What's happening is God is making Christ's enemies his footstool. That's what he's done in your life if you're a Christian. That's what he's about. You were an enemy of Christ. And he is making you Christ's footstool, if you like, to honour him. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Exactly what's happening on the day of Pentecost. He's ruling in the midst of his enemies. I mean, he's just explained how opposed and how deep the opposition was. So deep that they took him and crucified him. And now, out of this congregation, which he's just described that way, suddenly there's a whole host of people who have completely changed their allegiance and are now have come to Christ and are coming to Christ and coming gladly. What's he doing? He's ruling in the midst of his enemies. That's what he's doing. Very wonderfully. And then he says this. He says, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power they gladly received his word your people shall be the old version says your people shall be made willing in the day of your power it's what's happening in Acts chapter 2 in the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth this is just the beginning of this worldwide, incredible, unstoppable, global movement of redemption. You think of the millions and millions, billions no doubt, that have gone before us into heaven. Do you think that there is any more successful enterprise in the history of man than the Christian church? There isn't. There never has been and there never will be. And that's what he's realising here in Psalm 110. Well, moving along. So they are a, a willing, believing people because, God, because of God's grace and God's spirit and God's sovereignty and God's calling them and God's work. Salvation is the work of God, you see. But uh, he also identifies uh, this next thing he, he, he describes them as what I've, what I've termed a separated people, a distinct people, a different people, a separated people, because this is what he's emphasising in his sermon. Not what I'm emphasising, but it's what he's emphasising. And verse 40, look, in Acts 2, he says it. He's got a way of saying it. He, he doesn't, when he's preaching... Imagine him standing there and he's preaching to this assembled multitude. And they're a mixed multitude. So they're not all going to believe by any stretch of the imagination. Many are not going to believe. And so he, he's appealing to those whom God is calling, let's say. He's appealing to them and he says this. He says, be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved out of. If you wanted a, a more literal, a more literal understanding of what he's saying, you, you, not, he's not saying be saved in the perverse generation. No, I, I hope that isn't your concept of Christianity. Oh, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. John 17. 
be saved from this perverse generation. So there's a separation that's, that comes, a, a distinction. Whether you, whether you like it or not, that's just how it is. Um, if God is working, you see. And, and so he says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptised, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So he's, he's tracing out for you this distinct demarcation of this, this group of people now. And, and there's, there's a distinct demarcation. And here, in this particular event, uh, what's marking this, what, what marks this distinction is um, baptism. Baptism into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, the means of grace, the two, the two ordinances which we have been left with, the Lord's Supper and baptism. These are distinctly Christian things. These are things for people who are Christian, in whom the Spirit of God has worked, and who have called, who have been called, and these mark us as those who are uh, among God's people, you see. And, and so you can imagine, in some cultures today still, um, you think of cultures in Southeast Asia particularly, and, uh, and India in places, where they will tolerate you if you believe. They will tolerate you if you go to church. They won't take you seriously until you identify in, in, in one of these ways. You get baptised, no way. If you get baptised, then you are dead as far as they are concerned. They'll tolerate anything else. You might even tolerate you professing faith in Christ. But for you to take that step, which is in their mind clearly a step of demarcation and distinction, you see, they understand it. And so he emphasises that here um, very deliberately. So there's a, there's a difference. These are, you are now a different person. You are now a new creature in Christ. If you have received the gospel and the understanding of what that means, gladly, willingly, believingly received the gospel, see, you are now different. You belong to a completely different, uh, a, a completely different race, really. Your citizenship is now in heaven it's not in this world anymore. Uh, so you, 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 you get the idea there. More we could say about that. But let's quickly move on um, and uh, think, about, um, think about the third demarca- the third uh, theme or the third line of thought. Um, and the third line of thought is that they, are, they turn out to be immediately almost they, they persevere in this following of Jesus Christ. So there are persevering people. He, Luke, deliberately emphasises this as well. In verse 42, and he's, he's chosen his words because he wants to make this point to you. He says, describing this people now, uh, the people who have willingly believed and who have subjected themselves to this distinction and embraced it, Uh, He said, and they continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly. You can tell by the words he's using, what he's trying to make the point. He could, I mean, he could have just said continue. Continue steadfastly is almost like repeating yourself. And he wants to emphasize it. He wants to emphasize how they continued and how strongly they continued. So this is no flash in the pan. This is no, oh yeah, well I'm caught up in the emotion of the service and the moment. So, but you know, when when I get back into real life and people start asking me what I think I'm doing and persecuting me, I'm going to just withdraw. No, not at all. They continued steadfastly uh, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. 
It's a pretty simple program. It's a pretty simple church program. And would that every Christian church just followed this pretty simple Christian program would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, this is what it's all about. These are the non-negotiables. These are the things which are going to make you and build you and help you as a Christian. These things. Okay? The Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, the Breaking of Bread and Prayers. And over all of those four things, you could write Worship. Because that's what they are. They're worship. They are the key elements of worship. This is how you worship. This is how I worship. Now, obviously within this, there is a measure of both form and freedom. So not, not every... It's not prescribed that you do these things in a particular way. There's a degree of freedom. There's form. These are the things... But there's a measure of freedom uh, about that. We are aware of this, aren't we? Because, you know, some of us might be Presbyterian by conviction, some might be Baptist, some might be Congregationalist by conviction. And uh, in terms of how we structure uh, the the forums in which these things take place, um, it varies. But the bottom line is that these these are the key things Now, he's mentioned, very interestingly, signs and wonders. But all he's done is mention them. He hasn't. They're not included in the things in which they steadfastly continued. They're mentioned once and then they're not mentioned anymore. They're mentioned once, but they're not given the same degree of emphasis as these things Signs and wonders. Well, signs and wonders won't sustain you as a Christian. Signs and wonders won't build you. Signs and wonders won't disciple you. Signs and wonders aren't reliable. There are going to be people on the Day of Judgment who are really into signs and wonders and who could do it with the best of them. And God's going to say, Jesus is going to say, look, I'm sorry, but I never actually knew you. But we prophesied, we cast out demons, we raised the dead. Maybe you did. But I never knew you. Depart from me. He's going to say. So signs and wonders are notoriously unreliable. And and finicky. And flippant. (coughs) And feeling oriented. Now, having said that, God is a God of signs and wonders. Thank God he is. But they aren't the things which the Bible says are going to sustain your faith and grow you and save other people. Not at all. So he's really emphasising uh, this, these elements, this simple program and these elements of worship. Okay, moving right along, let's conclude with the fourth. There's more we could say about that, but let's move on to the fourth train of thought here. And this runs in the passage from verse, uh, well really from verse 44 to the end. So he's, he's explained to you that there is this group of people who willingly believe the gospel and they, 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 embrace, uh, they embrace it publicly, they identify with it, they are separated to Christ, they do that through baptism and so on. And they're continuing steadfastly, they're persevering. And now he tells us a little bit like this. He says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, form and freedom, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so here, what is he, what is he talking about here? 
Well, he's describing how this uh, this group of people, this new group of believing people, this church, he's describing to you uh, their their life together. And he's describing to you some aspects of it. And he's telling you it actually proved to be very attractive. And I, I really believe that. I, I, was, I was really one of the Humanly speaking, one of the things that made the greatest impression upon me as uh, a young man, totally lost from God. But one of the things that made the greatest impression on me was how attractive the lives of genuine born-again Christians were. I would never have told my mates I thought like that. But that was the reality. I saw what they had and I knew I didn't have it. And I was tremendously attracted by it. Wonderful. It seemed quaint. It seemed weird. It seemed old-fashioned. It seemed like something from another world. But nonetheless, it was so tremendously attractive. You see? And this is what he's saying here. He's saying things like this. These people were interested in community, not consuming. Wow. They were interested in community, not consuming. They were interested in people, not possessions. Relationships were important. There was apparently, among them, you're looking in from the outside, among these people there was genuine care and love and going the second mile for each other. They they had a God focus. They continued daily in the temple. You didn't have to do that. It's a bit extreme, isn't it? No, it's not. Wouldn't have been extreme for them. They couldn't get enough of it. They continued daily in the temple and there was one accord. Where's the strife? Where's the horrible members' meetings? Where's the divisions? They continued with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with simplicity of heart, praising God. I don't care what the world thinks, frankly. I don't give a stuff. Praising God and having favour with all the people. That was a byproduct of it. They weren't, they, they weren't setting their agenda to have favour with all the people. That was just inevitably what happened. You see? It's wonderful, isn't it? And what was the result? The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, okay, you're reading about revival. Do you want to know what revival looks like? Do you believe in revival? Do you believe in revival today? For the church today? Have you read any histories of revival? Revivals in places around the world amazing things suddenly a sudden tremendous influx of people into the kingdom the spirit of God moving in unprecedented ways yes I suppose you could say well we're reading about revival well maybe not really we're reading about what was this every day how it was how it should be So they were hungry for worship, they were salt, they were light. And inevitably, what radiated out of them was peace, love, purpose, joy, belonging, all the things which the world, if it was honest, would say, had a set a premium on and can't find them and can't buy them and can't make them. And this is where they are. This is where they are in the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and Amen.